The shilling finally halted what seemed to be a free fall that had the market worried about the risk of the exchange rate fueling inflation. Oil importers finally brought down pump prices a notch after public pressure. Welcome to this week's edition of your Money Matters program and the new business year which is now fully in motion following the holiday season. Coming up, business registration reforms in the offing. Plus, how do you make money through providing online content and how you can buy the right iron bars for your building? Stand Big Bank Uganda, claimed to be the biggest in the market, has a new managing director in Patrick Mwehire. In this week's View from the Top, we sound him out on his bank's SME proposition and banking in the context of existing macroeconomic dynamics. Yes, Mr. Mahiri, it's very nice to have you on the show. Money matters. Yeah. For starters, congratulations on taking on the mantle at uh, Stanbic Bank. Thank you, Charles. Very Appreciate good. That. I'll start with uh, you know the general outlook of how the banking industry is operating at the moment. I know you, much as you, you know, knew as MD Stanbic Bank, you've been in this market for quite some time as well. Mm. Um, I'm sure a number of our viewers would want to know how the industry is doing, the banking industry at the moment. Uh, what are the key things happening and what do they need to look out for? Mm. Mm. I mean, the banking industry is obviously tied into the macroeconomic picture. Mm -hmm. um, as you know, last year was a bit of a tough year in terms of consumer spending. We saw that actually uh, go flat. Okay. And that has implications on credit growth uh, because obviously a lot of our clients were not seeing the sort of demand that they needed to invest back into uh, machinery, equipment, uh, new facilities, etc. So we saw credit growth actually also shrink in the market last year. So I think I would say on average most banks uh, struggled in 2014. Okay. I think we did relatively okay and we will, you know, we're about to wrap up the numbers now. We're mm -hmm. just closing out. But I think we demonstrated some good growth from last year. Mm -hmm. So we're happy with where we ended up. Um, the prime rate across the industry remains relatively high. It's 18, 19 yes. percent. Mm -hmm. And it's really remained sticky at that period. Uh, I think we would love to see that number also come down a little bit. Mm -hmm. So for affordability and get people back into the mm -hmm. borrowing market. The borrowing um, market. Actually, the, the prime lending rate issue, because I know a number of uh, you know, business people that are watching this show, that's one of the key things that they look out for. I mean, based on the realities that you see around, where would you say, I mean, you see this or you would hing, uh, you know, the hope of having this rate coming down? Mm. Well, I think there's two bookends to this number, right? Yes. So we've got the one-year bond at 14.5% yeah. and prime at 19%. Okay. Um, so obviously there's a little bit of, you know, risk premium you have to add. You know, 14.5% is a risk-free rate. Yeah. And so that's how, you know, you get to the 19%. You're adding for default risk, credit risk, etc. Mm -hmm. So on a relative basis, if your benchmark is 14 and a half, yes. 19 is not far, off. not far off. So I think that the, the truth is, how do we get the benchmark down mm -hmm. lower, mm -hmm. closer to the CBR rate, which yes. is 11%? Mm -hmm. If we can deal that, mm -hmm. I think you'll see prime then shift down okay. uh, eventually. Very yeah. good. Yeah. Now, uh, of course, you know, uh, we've had, it's, it's more like, um, you know, uh, uh, a tagline of sorts nowadays mm. about SMEs being critical in driving you know, economic activity and growth uh, in this economy. Where do they sit uh, you know, in the plans that you have as a bank, Stanbic Bank? I know you're one of the major players in this market. Yeah. Uh, what plans do you have for them going forward, 2015 especially? Mm. Mm. SMEs are absolutely, you're right, they're the engine of growth. Yes. I think what Stanbic needs to figure out is how do we serve them and reduce the cost of serve to the SMEs yeah. so that it, it cost effectively they can borrow at much more attractive rates um, and they have the tools that they need to do business. Yeah. So th the first thing we're looking is internally and we have about 60,000 SME accounts. Yeah. Which ones need to come to the branch? Mm -hmm. Which ones need a relationship manager? Yeah. Which ones need a, a digital tab? Which ones need mobile money? Mm -hmm and then serve them appropriately based on their needs. Mm -hmm. And that way, you're relevant to them and, and serving them the cost the, 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 at, a, at a cost efficient manner. Very good. Yeah. Now, let's look at the realities in the market at the moment, because now, I mean, everyone sees how the shillings almost in a free fall against the dollar. 
Uh, we've seen oil prices also coming down. I don't know whether it's a good or a bad thing. Mm. Um, how do you think all these things play out for mm. you know, the banking function or business, if you like, in this market? Well, oil coming down is a good thing for Uganda because we're an importer of oil. Yeah. Uh, it's a bad thing for Russia. It's a good thing for Uganda because, I mean, the, our biggest import bill is fuel. So if that can drop 40%, um, that is a good thing for us. Do you think, I mean, uh, there's good room for optimism uh, in 2015 based on that? I mean, mm. if indeed it is, uh, what do you think is likely to drive this optimism above those challenges? Mm. Well, I think, you know, the oil price is, is a good thing. Yeah. I think that's going to reduce our import bill. It will help on our current account deficit. Yes. Um, I also think that we, because, like I said, the data improved in Q4 yeah. in terms of consumer spending. spending yeah. If that momentum increases, I think that that will be a good reason for optimism. Mm -hmm. I also think that, yes, it's a pre-election year, yeah. but the difference this time is we don't have a huge inflation mm -hmm. issue. Yeah. Um, yeah, of course, there's some inflationary pressure that's going to come from a weaker shilling, mm -hmm. but we're not going to be anywhere near that 25, 30% inflation rates that we had yes. the last election. Do you have any plans of helping at least uh, bolster, you know, the deserving uh, probably small and medium enterprises or farms, Ugandan, you know, to do more business within the region? Going back to the SMEs, the challenge that we're finding is that um, a lot of the SMEs um, have not really, they're not able to articulate from uh, a business point of view, the, the benefits for this expansion. So, and, th and this is something we're starting to work with, with SMEs on. Because it's one thing to say, you know, I need 50 billion, I want to go into Kenya. Yeah. The next question will be like, well, why are you going into Kenya? What's the opportunity? What's the profitability? Show me your projections for Kenya. Yeah. Show me how that dovetails into your capacity to produce, etc. And, and they start falling short on that. So I think it's a two-way street. In order to get banks to support that sort of expansion, there has to be that very articulate, concise feedback on the opportunity. Mm -hmm. And so that's one of the things that we're spending time on, in getting SMEs prepared, giving them the right support, and also encourage them to have the right level of, you know, of uh, professionalism at their companies that can articulate these things mm -hmm. from, a, from a banking perspective. Thank you very much, Ms. Amhair. It's been Thanks nice talking to you. Uganda's private sector still has the task of eliminating a whooping 725 billion shillings in cost burden resulting from multiple business licensing. According to a study conducted by the World Bank on Business Registration and Licensing, there's need for actual elimination, repealing and amalgamation of outdated procedures. In Insight this week, we consider the reforms that the Uganda Registration Services Bureau, the Private Sector Foundation, KCCA and the Lands Registry to cost 280 billion shillings. A host of business owners still face problems while seeking registration and licensing, even with World Bank records indicating that the cost burden to the private sector has been nearly 725.73 billion shillings. Those who are handling offices, we need to work, to be a servant, to serve, and to have our country at heart, and to take it that we are we are servants ready to serve, not to be bosses or want to be corrupted. We need to expand beyond the four that we see here, KCCA, URA, and URSB. I think we need to talk NEMA, we need to talk uh, immigration, we need to talk all these must come in because they mean a lot to starting a business. Such grievances are still part of the many that are being raised even with the World Bank funded reforms process on business licensing, indicating a new 26.4% in cost saving amounting to 188 billion shillings. Because once, once an agency has already done an inspection, it's not really necessary for another agency to go and do the same inspection. And that's where uh, we need to improve. Getting electricity, what is the problem? Where is the problem? Is it the transformers that need to be provided for that? Or is it just the process of applying? The Business Licensing and Reforms Committee spearheaded this exercise through the World Bank's Uganda Investment Climate Program. And we found there were as many as seven or so licenses. Some of them were duplication. 
uh, others were duplication, others were out of date, etc., etc. So as a result of the support provided, we were then able to analyze and then found those that needed to be cancelled, found those that needed to be merged, and then finally said the others needed to be strengthened through the legal arrangement. Among others, the Uganda Registration Services Bureau was also a central agency that was part of the business registration and licensing reforms. We have a large untapped informal sector which we think we can uh, formalize and, uh, 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 and put uh, in order. We have uh, uh, introduced strict compliance through uh, filing of returns, uh, legal reform and political support. The challenges are still manual systems that we use, the financial constraints, uh, which is our main cry for other agencies, main uh, human resource constraints. The International Finance Corporation, a private sector arm of the World Bank, insists that the instruments under the reform processes must now be fully utilized. Going forward, I want to encourage the private sector to make use of the reform feedback portal. Therein, they are able to feed back to government where they are finding problems, being able to make use of the services that are available through the various regulatory bodies. Where you find that you're having an issue and you're not able to quickly get the service that is required or is expected of you, yet you know government is saying it's issuing this service, then it's important for you to provide feedback through the reform feedback portal that is seated at Private Sector Foundation. It is also expected that these reforms would ultimately enable Uganda to improve its 150th position out of the 189 countries in the World Bank ease of doing The strength of your building or your home will partly depend on the strength of the ingredients. Today on Consumer Insight, we consider iron bars on issues like strength, plus using the right bars for a building and how to know if you have purchased the right product. You are undertaking a building project big or small, usually of your home. It's a given that you have a qualified construction technician or engineer. But it is of benefit to have some knowledge of your building materials. Today we discuss reinforcement bars. Not every bar will do the same job. There are three main types of reinforcement bars. Do you want the plain bar? Do you want the, the ribbed bar? Or do you want the cold twisted bars, which are very common, these ones which... You know, they have some kind of uh, lines yeah, moving around because that plane bar, which is square, they twist it. And then you have, uh, which are commonly used in most of our buildings. But um, for structural steel work, they normally recommend to use ribbed bars because that's what we have in the standard. Let's say you have identified the right type of bars. Size also matters. Almost all our manufacturers locally indicate also the size because that's where they cheat again because if you go to the market sometimes it's very difficult to differentiate between 10 and 12 eh, millimeter or 8 and 10 or 6 and 8 so if you don't know somebody can say this is 12 and it's actually what 10 so most manufacturers in the interest of uh, protecting the consumers and making sure that they protect their name they put uh, the size also so that gives you further guidance of course, you'll find that maybe it's covered with the rust, but if you're a keen consumer, take a little bit extra effort. It does not hurt to engage a qualified construction practitioner or to do some reading of your own to acquaint yourself with these basic facts because an informed consumer is a hard one to cheat. There is, of course, the basic step for such seemingly complicated things like types and sizes of reinforcement bars, trusting the place or people from whom you buy. Traceability is fundamental. Where are you buying it from? Two, you look at the product. Those products are labeled. Those iron bars, reinforcement bars, they are actually what? Labeled. They are supposed to contain, to bear the name of the manufacturer. That's an abbreviation. For example, if it's a roofing, rolling mills, it could be RRM. And then it's also supposed to bear the grade of that steel. That gives you an indication of the strength of that particular reinforcement bar. Evidently, 
attempts at helping the consumer exist, even for reinforcement bars. It's up to you to get to know a little more so that you can get value for your money. What was originally just a beautiful friendship gave rise to a beautiful business partnership that eventually led to a budding business venture, 256 Express. Ben, Peter and Bob took advantage of their individual qualities and uniform vision and started an online business where they purchased goods for interested clients and delivered them right to their doorstep at a pocket-friendly cost. A media personality, an IT consultant, and an international school teacher. Three different gentlemen from three different careers, but having one unifying factor, passion. It's this passion, however, that gave rise to their now brainchild, 256 Express. But what exactly was the inspiration behind 256 Express? We buy literally all our stuff online. And over the last three or four years, we've had a lot more people requesting us saying, can you also bring something for me? Can you bring something for me? Can you bring something for me? And it's gotten to the point where we thought, wait, there's too many requests. Why don't we actually put them in one place together and do it on a commercial basis? So the concept is easy. You go online, you find an item. I get in touch with 256 Express. And we quote it for you. We find out how much it is, what it will cost you to bring it here. And then we'll give you a quote and bring the item. There was also an existing need for affordable and quality items that were not easy to come by in the country, a gap that 256 Express sought to fill. What we realize in Uganda is that a lot of the products that we get, you find something that if you went online, I'll give you a good example, 40-inch um, TV, a smart TV in Uganda right now will probably cost you about 7 or 8 million shillings. You go to Amazon and the thing costs about $600, which is 1.5 million. Even after you include shipping, for just eat alone in terms of the dimensions and taxes from URA, it, there's no way it comes to that amount. So you're able to make a saving by bringing it in yourself. So if they're supposed to help the customer save money, how then do they make their money? We make our money in a very simple way. Our charge is 5% of the best price. The best price is the price of the item as it appears online. So a product is $20. Our charge is 25% of $20. So what happens is that when we bring in the item, we, we pay for shipping. We pay, and the shipping includes inf insurance for the item. And then we pay taxes, revenue, Uganda Revenue Authority taxes. So withholding tax, import duty, and VAT. That is charged on the item. But that's not the best price. The best price is just the price of the item. Like any other business, they contend with their own challenges. Biggest issue has been shipping. Because the, the model of business that we are running works on being able to get a lot of orders and consolidated shipping. That For means... example, someone says, I want a product now until tomorrow. And they think that we can actually bring in the product tomorrow. But the, thing, the truth is that even if we're able to bring in the product within four days, if you're buying from the U.S., between getting the item from the warehouse to your address may take two whole days. For now, in as far as aspirations are concerned, the sky is the limit for them. A few years from now, we want to take over the East African market. We want anyone who wants anything to come to us. We think that we can be able to grow to that level where we're the biggest, call it the biggest online supermarket in Uganda in the next two or three years. With technology slowly and steadily taking over the way things are done, some are using this as an opportunity to not only meet their personal needs, but also make an extra buck in the process. 256 Express is one such entity that has set out to make the lives of the online shopping community much easier. Next now are the latest figures from our equity market.
that's it on Money Matters this week. My name is Malcolm Sime. And in case you want to get back to us, text us on 6565. Give us your views and comments and what you think about Money Matters on NTV. You can also look for NTV Money Matters on Facebook. Until next week, cheers.